Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Full Pelt Music Podcast. Shortly we'll be chatting with the Dolly Rots after they release their new album Night Owls. But before then, the usual reminder from myself. If you would, please do follow Full Pelt on social media. We're on Facebook at Full Pelt and on Twitter and Instagram at Full Pelt Music. And again, if you would, please do hit that like button, hit that subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. Welcome to uh, Kelly from the Dolly Rots to the Full Pelt Music Podcast. Absolutely delighted to have you on. How are you today? I am great. I I do sound a little bit under the weather, but I I feel really good inside. So don't feel bad for me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that is definitely always the main thing, um, feeling good inside. And you must be feeling really good because obviously Night Owls has just come out, uh, your latest album. So always an exciting time for a band. And you've just been out playing some shows as well, which again is always an exciting time. So um, obviously, as we talk, you're in between a couple of smaller runs of shows. How are the shows going, Kelly? Oh, it's been so much fun. Uh, sometimes a little too much fun. And, you know, I, I don't know. The We had a record release party in New York City and we hadn't played New York City in about a year. And it was just beautifully insane. We had people fly in from like Poland and the UK and, you know, all the way across the States and we had surprise, surprise friends show up. So it was a beautiful night. But yeah, all the shows that we just played were so much fun. Um, the band that we had out with us, Kings of the Wild Things band, they were a lot of fun. They're a great band, but they were just, they were a lot of fun to hang out with. Um, Lewis, the guitarist and, and me, we have kids too. And so, you know, we always, we bring the kids on almost all the tour dates, you know, typically, and they were there and man, those kids kept them entertained. It was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah I bet they did um and uh yeah I mean you touch on it there really there's such a great community around the band um both you know the the fans and obviously just you know uh fellow friends that have uh sort of come into that um community and um I say Night Owls um has just come out so obviously everyone as part of that um sort of fan base has got something new to to sink their teeth into and uh you know our review it is such a fun just like great pop punk record um definitely one of the best from from the band and that's saying something because your back catalogue is phenomenal um and listeners <laughs> obviously you know should should check it all out but um yeah night owl is such a great album and i just wanted to ask obviously because feedback is just so instantaneous these days um you know how have how have you felt the album's gone down with that fan base it- insanely good i mean even i think there was one uk interview and it was like the guy just wished he didn't like it or not interview um a review he it it was almost as if he didn't want to like it but in the end he just couldn't help but say it was awesome and that people should listen to it so that it's been overwhelmingly positive and and that feels really good i mean We were putting out albums every two years for about 20 years. And then, you know, all that stuff happened a couple of years ago. So, you know, we haven't put out an album of all new material in four years. And so, you know, it gets to this point where you're kind of like, have have we lost our mojo? Like, can we still do this? When are we going to get this done? And, and so, you know, once, once we finally started to, to really work on it, it, it went pretty quickly and, you know, that happened after we started touring again and felt inspired. And, and so I think it, it comes from a very a joyful place, but you know, we're also, we've, we've grown a lot in the last four years. And so I think that's reflected in the songs as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. There is definitely a kind of, I guess, added maturity uh, to, to the sound of the album, although it's still just infectiously um, just like great fun and like it does not surprise me us uh you music journalists like writing a review yeah quite often we're quite keen to oh no we're not gonna like this let's write a bad review and uh i can't i can't imagine it's possible to write a, a, a negative review for, for night owls though because it is just so <laughs> uh, say infectious that it, it will win you over um yeah definitely and um obviously you touched on um yeah, you've you've had such a consistent outlay o- over the the period of your career. You know, new albums every sort of two or three years, just consistently coming out. And uh, obviously, to maintain the quality you have, again, um, I got to admire that massively. Um, but with this one, and and you touched on you know the thing that we'd probably all rather stop talking about now um, that happened to, to the world. Um, you know, with that and with the delay, you know, did it change up 
your recording process at all? Was it a different experience this time around? Um, when it when we finally started, it was pretty much the same thing that that we've been doing for the past I guess four records. Um, but it was the getting started part that wasn't happening. Um, you know, we were home for a year with our kids. You know, they didn't go to school for a whole year, and we weren't touring. We weren't doing the things that inspire us, and we were still trying to write music. You know, we would go into our studio and and we would we would start songs, but we couldn't finish anything. You know, we we would just kind of get down on it and be like, ah, it kind of sucks. You know, we'll try again later. And then we go and we start another song and be like, ah, it sucks too. You know, and it it turns out it was more our attitude that sucked than the songs because, you know, once we got back out on tour, we were like, all right, we got to do this record. We got to do this record. Um, we, we booked time with our producer, John Fields, and, you know, we knew we only had so long to, to write it. And I think it was probably like four or five months. And so Lewis started looking through all those bits and pieces that we had started and not finished. And we were shocked by, by how much was there and also how, how good it was. And so, you know, we had a lot to already work with. We, some of the songs are like bits put together that, you know, didn't necessarily weren't intended to be together, but ended up that way. You know, like some of the Beatles songs. It's like, well, that doesn't go with that, but you know, then it's one of your favorites. Um, so once we started, it was cool. And then, you know, Lewis and I record the, well, Lewis records the, all the stuff at home. He does like all the engineering and, you know, the producing of the early stuff. We would do like bass, guitar, uh, drum programming and main vocals, sometimes even backing vocals at home. And then we go, we fly, we meet our producer after we've sent him all the stuff that we did at home. And, you know, he's like, he's like, that's great redoing that you know still we still needed like all the bridges we didn't have any bridges <laughs> written um and so then we spent a week with him finishing it all up polishing it you know re-singing some things you know sometimes he would pick up his bass and be like i want to do this thing instead and you know it it went really quickly once that happened the art came together really fast um it it all just went together easily and we turned it in in the spring so it kind of feels like it's it's been out in the world for a long time to us, but in reality, people are just hearing it. So that's also kind of weird when you put out an album. Yeah, it's something that a lot of artists that have been on the podcast have actually said that that gap between finishing the recording and, and production of the album, then it coming out, and by the time it comes out, it's not quite as fresh, you know, to the yeah, artist. I'm like, wait, what songs are on it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, um, and it's really fascinating to hear you talk about, obviously, your experience of, of the pandemic and, and being able to write in that time, because it's kind of the opposite of what a lot of artists on this podcast have said, where, whereby they said the extra time the pandemic gave them, you know, they were happy with what they ha they recorded first time around, but then because they had that extra time, they kept going back to it and probably yeah. tinkered with it too much. And by the time they put it out, it was unrecognisable. And actually they wish they had just left left be um, with, with what they'd originally worked on. And obviously yeah, you didn't really like what you really, or didn't feel like you liked what you originally worked on. It turned out when you went back to it, it was <laughs> good. So yeah, really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the pandemic, we had way less time than in our normal life, which we already have no time um, because we have two little kids. And so, you know, we were parenting, but I mean, anybody else who has kids know, like when your kids are home, like it's, especially if there are two of them and you got, you know, these two personalities, you have to balance. They don't get to play with their friends. They're not going to do activities. They have all this energy. They're supposed to be doing Zoom school. And that was kind of a nightmare, like not really happening. You got to feed them like a hundred snacks a day, yes. three square meals. And it's just, you're constantly like cleaning, cooking, you know bridging the gap between the crazies and you know I, I also have a radio show five days a week and so you know between that stuff and just trying to keep our heads on straight by the time we could like get out you know alone together it'd be like midnight and we would be so drained and exhausted that it was just hard to make ourselves do it <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can uh, emphasize so much with that. I've got two little boys myself, and yeah, um, yeah I, I hope we never have to go back to that. I say, like you say, homeschool, and just it just never happens. No, I mean the teachers tried, but it just <laughs> no, 
No, exactly. When when your kids, you're sitting down in front of the laptop and you say, right, you're going to sit here for the next two hours and listen to this. There's not a lot you can do when they just walk away and say, I'm not doing it, because you don't really want to be on film sort of pinning them down, do you? So uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> there were funny moments like that, though. Yeah, I think we can look back on it now and laugh, yeah. but certainly not at the time. <laughs> no. Um, and uh, obviously with Night Owls as well, you worked with uh, Wicked Call cool Records um, for, for, I believe, the first time. So I just, obviously we've had a couple of their artists on the podcast and we've heard some really good things about them. So I just wanted to see you know, what your experience was of, of working with them. Well, we actually, we, we put out a seven inch with them, uh, gosh, probably five releases ago-ish. Um, but then our last album, Daydream Explosion, was also on Wicked Cool. Oh. And um we had we had known, of course, of of the radio station connected to Wicked Cool. They're both Stevie Van Zant's record label and radio station. Station is Underground Garage, and they started playing us when we were on Blackheart Records when our second album came out. Um, we gave because I'm awesome a lot of airplay, and we got to go in and meet Stevie, and it was really really cool. And I you know we have been self self releasing, you know, albums on our own label for a while. And they were like, well, what do you want to do a seven inch? And we we're like, yeah, sure, of course. Like, we'll do, we love doing seven inches. We do all sorts of weird seven inches. And we did it. And it was such a good experience um, it, because obviously it's an artist label. It's a musician friendly label. They're not, they're, their top concern is not money, you know, making money out of their artists. They just, they like to promote the artists that, that they like. And, and it's really that simple. And so to be liked by them feels very nice. Um, and they've got great distribution and the support is really, really, you know, it means something when somebody that you've looked up to says, hey, you're doing a good job and I want to make sure more people hear what you're doing. And so, yeah, it's been a really good partnership. I think it it helps mm-hmm. us to get to more people and and it doesn't hurt anything along the way because, you know, sometimes you have to give up a little bit something to get something else but in this case we don't have to give up anything we have full creative control hey let us do it whatever we need to do on pretty much on our timeline too which is really cool yeah wicked cool even oh dad joke yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um <laughs> it's uh yeah such a refreshing um sort of concept for a record label isn't it to actually nurture the artists for the artists rather than for, for yourself um but yeah it's a subtle difference but a major one um and yeah anyone that's checked out night owls um i'm sure i've already clocked just how great an album it is but they, they would also have experienced the the first track on the album is five plus five which is um your latest single um that, that's come out so i just wanted to touch on that song and just ask you know what, what what is the story of that song here what's it about and what did it how did it come together for you well have you ever thought someone was just beautiful as a human and they just feel like crap about themselves and they just can't see it i mean that's pretty much what that one's about yeah. i mean you know, we brought some of ourselves into it too, but, you know, it's just that idea that, you know, a lot of the time you don't see the beauty in yourself, but other people do. And, you know, maybe when you get a compliment, you should try and take it and maybe make it let you feel a little better about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> great song. Great advice as well. So yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, And I, I always uh, look uh, people that listen to this podcast will know I'm obsessed with, with music videos and, uh, the like because I grew up watching them and um yeah it's a bit of a lost start and um I've been really impressed actually not necessarily with the music video but with the lyric videos that you've been putting out because that's become a lot more of the done thing these days uh, is to put lyric videos out but quite often they are very very plain yours are yeah they expand on on the possibilities that you that come along with with a lyric video so I just wanted to touch on that with you and see you know you know where the sort of concepts come from for for those so we've been working with a videographer. His name's Andrew Hooper. He lived in Sacramento, California. Um, he's just moved to Thailand. Um, but we met him through Cappy from the Groovy Ghoulies. And, you know, he had done some videos for him. And we were in one of the videos. I was really, really pregnant, too. I can't remember what it's called now. I want to say it's called Romeo and Juliet. It's a Cappy Ghoulie song. I don't think that's what it's called. But that's the idea. Um, he... He's just an amazing visual artist and we pretty much leave it up to him. We send him lyrics. We of course send him the songs, maybe a couple ideas, and then he just runs with it. And 
you know, we've been doing this with him for, oh my gosh, like four albums, I think, because it became apparent that people were going to YouTube to listen to music yeah. quite a while ago. And it's really cool. I, I loved growing up watching MTV and VH1, watching music videos, you know. And so I understand the appeal of, of that. And we just want people to be able to experience the album in whatever way they like. You know, if if you want to sing along, then you can read the lyrics. I also used to do that. I hold like my little my little tape paper, try and read like sing along as I played it. And, you know, we just try to give as many options so that more people have access to it. And yeah, the way he puts it together, it's just, it's just so cool. The barefoot and pregnant ones. Oh, he, he's nailed it every time. But yeah, if you go back, any of those album lyric videos, that's him. And yeah. you know, he's grown and his style has changed a bit over time too. It's, it's been really cool. Yeah, they are really cool. Uh, and just, yes, yeah, it brings something from sort of different and help bring songs to life. I, I feel so uh, definitely listeners, as Kelly said, YouTube is the place to, to check these out these days. There'll be a link in the bio of the episode, and obviously listeners can uh, can click through and go and check those out. And there's one on there for uh, Still Holding On, which was a standalone single that come out of the recording sessions, I believe, for, for Night Owls, and obviously came out ahead of it, where obviously there's an AI version of of, of yourself, which, uh, yeah, is, is a pretty on-topic, uh, you know, uh, video to put out there. So I did try to dive in as well because it is a, a hot topic and uh it's becoming one of the regular questions that gets asked and you'll probably be sick of hearing it at some point soon probably but you know what what in your opinion are you know the dangers of ai coming into the, the music industry i think it's terrifying I, I think it's terrifying as an artist but i think just for humanity <laughs> our, it, it seems as though as as people it's become harder and harder for us to decipher fact from fiction in the news, um, in in so many ways, because you know, when uh, decades ago, generation ago, there there were certain news sources that were non biased, and you could trust them, and you knew, like when you turned on the news, at five o'clock, six o'clock, you you could understand what they were saying, you could trust it, you you knew that that was factually what was happening, and, and then news became entertainment, and now it, it's just very hard. For people to to already determine the truth of of the world, and I I feel like AI is going to make it even harder because you can you could take that little AI version of me that Lewis and his best friend Byron worked on for like three days. If you worked on that for two weeks, yeah. and you know I have all these radio shows. We even have one that speaks. If we fed it, you know, just a few more days of radio shows, me talking, I could be put on a screen and made to say anything in the entire world and and that goes for every human on the face of the planet and people aren't gonna know like they already don't know what's real and what's not and i i think that's really i don't know how humanity's gonna deal with that but i think it's definitely something i feel unsettled about and obviously as an artist i i mean that's like way below how concerned i am about you know yeah. the, the big stuff um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you can make me sing any song in the world. There's so much of my voice is already out there. And so I could be made to say anything. I could, could make me sing Sinatra songs. Like it, it's so strange because, you know, it's not me and I have no control over my presentation to the world. Unless it's like, hey, this is me. It's not an AI, but even my mm. AI could say that, you know, it's yeah. so strange. So yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not into like super regulation, and you know, giving people less freedom. And so I, I don't know what the the way to deal with it will be. But hopefully as it unfolds, people that are more wise than me will help us figure it out. <laughs> That's what we have to hope, isn't it? De definitely. Um, yeah, that lack of control is definitely frightening. Uh, I agree with that completely. Um, but obviously, one place where AI is never hopefully going to interrupt is is obviously one of the best things about the music industry is getting out on stage as you have been recently and playing shows and you know as much as AI can it's quite in, you know try and imitate you know the rest of it you know you can't replicate that feeling of being in a venue watching a live act and you uh you know the dolly rots I've, I've caught live in the past and you are one of the best at, at doing that at building that connection with the audience and uh you know definitely encourage listeners to come along to a show if they can um which obviously brings me on to the question i have for you in 
and, and it's simply, and he won't, probably won't be able to announce anything because that's the way the, the industry works. But obviously, after this run of shows, there's a, your diary is looking rather empty. You know, our listeners is going to have an opportunity to, to catch Night Owls and the songs from Night Owls live over the next kind of year or two. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, it will happen. I don't have exact dates yet. Um, and nothing is confirmed. But we're we're really trying to figure it out. Our last trip over there, we were with Don't Panic. It was so much fun. I mean, we've we've been going over there for years, of course, going for soup. Um, but we hadn't done a headline tour on our on our own yet. And so, you know, I was nervous about it. I needed the kids to be a little older, you know, throwing them in a van, dragging them to hotel rooms. It's hard to do with babies. So, you know, now is the time. And we had a blast. We it was so cool to play those venues really close up with with people and i mean those are my my favorite shows to be honest i mean i, I love playing big shows too but you know i, I like us a, a medium-sized club gig where you know i can see everybody i can connect with people afterwards i can actually talk to everybody and you know get to know people is i that's the fun part to me <laughs> so so yeah we we will be back we had a great great tour so we just have to do it again yeah no we can't wait to welcome you with uh open arms obviously and uh you, you touched on that ability you have uh, uh you know building a connection and there's something that actually sort of crept in over the last few episodes uh, of this podcast because we've had some a few great live acts in a row like on this podcast that um obviously you've got similar experience yourself in, in playing bigger shows playing smaller shows you know headline shows festival shows support and shows you know you've got a good amount of experience of the different types of uh, live show there is and uh, just the question would be you know if you were to give advice to a young up-and-coming sort of band just trying to break through now on how to set about building that connection on stage um you know how, what advice would you give don't wait for those opening gigs like the slots where you open for your favorite band because as fun as it is and as good as it can be for your career you could be out playing pubs like you know three nights a week and that's how you learn how to be a band. It's how you learn to be good to fans. It's how you get stronger um, emotionally and physically. You got to carry all your gear yourself. You know, it. if you really want to be a band, you just have to start playing out in front of people. It's a completely different experience than being in the studio. Um, and, you know, you could be the best band in the world in the studio, but then you get on stage and you you have to hone that as a completely different skill set. And so we always tell bands, it's like, how do I get started? Well, I don't have a manager. I don't have a booking agent, so I can't do it. It's like, you're not going to get one until they, you know, you need that. And until somebody looks at you and says, well, I can make a little money off of this. So I might as well do it. Like people don't take on bands for pity. They, they, it's a business. Yeah. So the way to make yourself look enticing is to be a working band. And so it's work. And it's fun work, but you know, it's work. You just got to get out there and play whatever shows you can book yourself. You yeah. know, and and have fun. Yeah, sound Some advice. Of my favorite shows. I look back <laughs> on our early tours, and you know, sometimes there were five people there, including the bartender and yeah. like the door guy, and still, you know, it was wonderful in so many ways. So, you just got to do it. Yeah, definitely agree. Fantastic advice. Um, for for yeah. But people just starting out definitely definitely um do the work as you say um and the sort of final big portion of the podcast that we've had recently uh is something we're calling magic wand um so obviously we ran touched on ai because of, of the video it's something that actually hasn't come up on the podcast so far um but we do often find ourselves treading into um sort of issues within the music industry so we brought the section in and we're going to go into fantasy land for a moment kelly and i'm going to give you a magic wand uh, and I'm going to allow you um, to change one thing about the music industry, but one thing only, which is where it can be a bit of a struggle. <laughs> um, so um, with the magic wand today, what would you change about the music industry? I think probably it would be the payouts for streaming services. Yeah. Because it's just not fair. Um, and I, if I could change it to be, you know, the most perfect way it it would be tiered in a way where you know not the biggest acts get the most money per play but you know the opposite where you know if 
a like brand new younger band is getting, you know, 3000 plays, maybe they get, you know, $30, you know, but it, it doesn't extrapolate the same to like 3 million plays. I feel like if it could be a tiered system that actually helped develop and encourage musicians to keep working on their music, that would be a beautiful thing and it would never happen. So. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it is it's one that's come up a few times and in the uk it's even been going through you know committees in in parliament they've been looking at it and obviously sort of come coming up with concepts around you know if um you know i subscribe to a certain um you know streaming platform and i listen predominantly to the dolly rots well the money that i've paid should go predominantly to the dolly rots because that's what i'm listening to um and that's obviously fairer than my money going to Ed Sheeran, who I've not listened to. <laughs> so, right. yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a really valid one that has come up and definitely something that needs, does need to change one way or, or another. So, uh, you know, thank you so much for that, Kelly. And uh, obviously, as, as we sort of come to an end, to, to go full circle, obviously, Night Owls, such an incredible album, and listeners really do need to to check it out. Um, obviously, there'll be links in the bio to, to go through um, and do that. And um, also, stay up to date with the band. Um, you make my life really easy, uh, Kelly, with the Dolly Rots, because I always give out the social handles. And sometimes I've got three different social handles, and there's all sorts of underscores and all of this kind of stuff in there. You are literally the Dolly Rots across the board. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. Job and well done. Talk to me. I'm Kelly Dolly Rot. <laughs> and then Lewis is Lewis Dolly Rot, but he's only on like Twitter and a couple other things. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I love it. It's, it's uh, it say, makes my life a lot easier. And you've done really, really well with that. And uh, obviously, um, just wish you all the best with, with everything you've got coming up with the band. Um, it's that much, obviously such an exciting time. And I always just give the final sort of sort of segment over to the guests and say, what would be your final message for the listeners today? Oh, go out and see some live music. It feels good. You'll be happy that you did it. And, you know, bands, bands could use it right now. All bands, you know, just go and check out the venues. The venues could use it too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like we got to gotta keep live music going and happy. So yeah, go out and see a band for me. That would make me happy. Yeah. Beautiful final message and one I couldn't agree more with. No, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Kelly. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you everyone for listening. I really do hope you enjoyed that chat there with the Dolly Rots. Do make sure you check out their new album, Night Owls, and of course, follow the band across social media to stay up to date with everything coming from them. You can also stay up to date with Full Pelt. We're on Facebook at Full Pelt and on Twitter and Instagram at Full Pelt Music. And finally, if you would, please do hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, wherever you're watching or listening, because we'll be back very soon with another episode of the Full Pelt Music Podcast. <laughs>